Hey Theology fans, I'm about to share some of the universe's deepest secrets with you here on this seventh episode. Seventh, so auspicious. Seventh episode of my RCIA. It's auspicious because as I spoke about Hebrew numerology earlier, seven is the number of the sacrament, meaning the fulfillment of the promises of Yahweh and whatnot. And, uh, and I'm already two sheets to the wind, and I'm probably just going to honestly get shit-faced here. And I really kind of didn't mean for it to work out that way, but I found an opportunity to, you know, be up late and uninterrupted. And fucking, that refrigerator is so loud, and I'm so sorry about that. I swear I'm going to buy a better microphone one of these days. But, um, today, I wanted to share with you the sacrament of marriage. I want to go through all the sacraments eventually, but... Marriage is really the big one. It's like the 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 one, the realest one. <clears throat> and um, there's really, I would not be doing it justice to marriage if I had any other drink than a Manhattan. So I'm going to show you how to make one of those, even though I've had about four drinks already. So let's begin this one, the way we begin all things. In the Father, Son, the Holy Spirit, Amen. <clears throat> Saint Michael, the Archangel, defend us in battle. Be our protection against the wickedness and snares of the devil. May God rebuke him, we humbly pray, and do thou, O Prince of the Heavenly Hosts, by the power of God, thrust into hell Satan and all evil spirits who prowl about the world, seeking the ruin of souls. Amen. Remember, O most gracious, loving Virgin Mary, that never was it known that anyone who fled to thy protection, implored thy help, or sought thy intercession, was left unaided. Inspired by this confidence, I fly unto thee, O Virgin of Virgins. To thee do I come, before thee I stand, sinful and sorrowful. O Mother of the Word incarnate, despise not my petitions, but in thy mercy hear and answer me. Amen. Probably the most potent prayer to say to the Blessed Virgin Mary that you could ever say. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Amen. Lastly, newly sanctified saint. Oh my gosh, what's his name? Matthew Talbot. Saint Matthew Talbot is the newfangled saint of uh, drunks. So he was an Irish Catholic who uh, got trashed all the time and was a lot more faithful than people gave him credit for. Um, turned his life around, got sober, more than I can save myself. And um, anyway, cool dude. And I pray to him that he helps me make it through this without getting too shitty and also wake up in time to take my kids to school. But. You know, school is uh, only so important. Whatever, man, they're in elementary school. It's not going to go on their permanent record. School's kind of a joke anyway, let's be honest. We know how the government's going. It's all just a propaganda campaign. I think it's more important to educate both my children and you all about what God's about, what the sacraments are about. And I want to dedicate this drink to his church and to the future of the faith that Jesus instilled on earth, that we carry this torch no matter what happens to society. Matthew Talbot, please let me give this a justice and then maintain my responsibilities in the morning. In the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, Amen. So, how do we make a Manhattan? See, this is representative of a sacrament to me because a Manhattan is where the earthly world and the spiritual world kiss, much like a sacrament. Uh, where what happens in the physical world is a mirror image of what happens in the spiritual world, and they're both real. The symbolism is not just symbolism, it is truly taking place in the spiritual realm. It's a bit like Zelda 3, like, you know, you move this bush and shit happens in the dark world, like, it's, it's, it's that real. But realer than, you know, just being a game. So, here's how this gets kicked off. <coughs> Obvi, we start with a couple of rocks. Don't be fooled by the ones that I got. I'm still, I'm still Theo from the block. Uh, <clears throat> Secondly, get some good whiskey. I mean, you can honestly. You could use Kentucky Gentleman if you wanted to, because you're going to mix it with other ingredients, and it's going to be uh, tasty no matter what you do. But I will say that a rye whiskey is 
a better uh, candidate for a um, Manhattan. Fuck oh, shit. Yeah, I'm doing it. <laughs> you know, hopefully I do a lot. You know what? I'm, just, I'm at the end of this bullet. Let's just kill it. Let's just kill it. Let's bite the bullet. I'm doing it. I'm biting the bullet. I know how I'm gonna spend my next paycheck. And um, but yeah, rye whiskey is 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 good. It gives you a little bit more flavor, a deeper, earthier flavor. And this here represents God the Father. Okay. And then this here is called not wet vermouth, not dry vermouth either. Sweet vermouth. Thank you, sweet vermouth. It is a liqueur made from red wine that is further distilled, a bit like brandy, but not quite the same. I am pouring these, I think the way my, the way my dad does it is about two-thirds whiskey and one-third uh, sweet vermouth. I like more of a 50-50 blend, and this one's turning out to be about a 60-40. Um, <clears throat> but however you want to do it, you, you mix and match until you find the, the uh, proportions you enjoy. And um, But we're not done yet. In addition to the Father and the Son, we got a little of the Holy Spirit to dump in here. Some maraschino cherries. You put a little bit of the blood of Christ in there. And um, just in time for Easter, which at the time of this recording was this past Sunday. But yeah, you take some of the cherry juice. You know, one or two cherries for garnish. They're in, by the way, they will sop up this liquor over the course of you drinking it. And it is delicious at the bottom. But, um... Yeah, a couple of cherries and then a splash of juice. And let's not forget some aromatic bitters for his suffering, right? This is, this is how you justify um, drinking as a Catholic, is you just dedicate it to Jesus. Is what you, do. So you always offer up your suffering, right? That's what we do. So, stir that little guy. I was told, you know, some people like to use a shaker for this, and at bars they often will. Um, but I was told that you're supposed to stir brown liquor and shake clear liquor. I hardly know it. So, we're going to get right into this marriage thing. Because the thing that is kind of effed up about the marriage. Oh, cheers, beat the doves. Clink. Let's see what's. Let me back up a second. In episode 6, I did a whole lot of uh, talking about the theology of the body. And I had this sweet-ass triangle diagram. And I highly recommend going back and watching that episode. Because I just rewatched about half of it. And I thought it was really good. Um, you know, even though it's all off the cuff. And I'm just kind of talking out my ass. But um, it actually was, like, super deep. And give it a shot. But um, a lot of what I'm going to say here about marriage is just extrapolating on that it's just building from it okay because the whole like structure of the universe is really based on marriage so much to the point that if you did one of these heuristic studies like you know jordan peterson's gonna do and you take the bible and you break it up into all the chunks of all the ways that there was ever a relationship to god right where um you know jesus calls him abba the father which it's more of a um a familiar term right it's like it's like daddy and, and uh so so there's a familiar relationship there at least as far as once you get jesus prior to that you know god is more of the benevolent master and all these other things but of all the metaphors for the relationship of people to god and israel to god the one that happens the most often mathematically statistically when you break up the bible is marriage god's relationship to us is a marriage god is married to israel Israel is his bride. This ha this happens over and over and over again. It's far and away, like by a magnitude of two at least, the most common metaphor for how God tries to relate to us is he's married to us. We're committed to him. He's committed to us. It's a covenant. I've talked about this before. A covenant is not a contract. It doesn't expire at a certain term. It is for life. It is renewed. It goes on forever, right? <clears throat> So, the thing about marriage is that it is one of, I am kind of skipping to the end, as far as the seven sacraments go, 
I'll zoom through them real quick in uh, life phases. I feel like that's the easiest way to remember them. You get baptized as a baby, generally speaking, when you're a Catholic. Protestants like to do it when they're, you know, age of reason or some shit. And converts do it, obviously, past the age of reason. But standard practice is when you're a baby, you're baptized. Then you get your first confession because you have to clean your soul so that you can be ready for first communion. And then you... Those are the three, what's called the sacraments of initiation. After those three, you're really kind of a practicing Catholic. Further than that, there's confirmation. Confirmation is basically like baptism over again, except this time, instead of your parents answering for you when you're a baby, you are asked directly, do you really believe all the shit your parents said when you're a baby? And you're like, uh, yes, I, yeah, I do. And you take the vow yourself. Um, as far as Protestants are concerned, Honestly, the way Protestants do baptisms is kind of like a baptismal confirmation at once. If you want to think of it that way. If you're a Protestant, that's how you should look at it. Um, but with Catholics, they break that into two phases. The dedication as baptism and the affirmation as confirmation. Or that's why it's called confirmation. I, I confirm that everything my parents said that I believe in is what I actually decided that I will believe in. And I will... Uh, give myself to it, which is why I like to say affirmation instead, because I'm now willfully committing myself to the things I said that I would do, or that my parents said I would do as a baby. Um, so I guess those four sacraments are really the initiation ones. Um, after that, there are what's called the sacraments of service. And your options are marriage or holy orders. And to be honest, they're kind of the same thing. We'll get into this in a minute. But the focus on today, just this episode, is just me marriage, marriage, regular marriage. Um, last after that is the anointing of the sick, is the seventh sacrament. And that one's a sacrament of healing, is what they say. Which I guess, I'm going to back up. The sacrament of reconciliation slash penance slash confirmation. It, or, no, blah, 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 blah. Sorry about that. Reconciliation, confession, penance. These are all the same thing. Those are considered a healing sacrament, and those are lumped in with the anointing of the sick. I'm going to cover all that shit in a future episode. I'm just going to focus now on marriage. Like the marriage, like the real marriage, the one you know with the husband and wife. Okay? But it's a sacrament of service is what I'm getting at. Because the thing is, much like the triangle diagram, it's layered. It's not just service, you know, you to your wife or wife to your husband. It's also to the community. In a certain way, you are serving the community by building your family, by having children, by being part of the parish. Like, it's an outward sign that you're a big brick in the wall of the temple. Like, that's a good thing. You know, you're not worthless. You're not un... Un, I mean, you know, historically maybe you're unknown, but honestly, like, those bottom bricks of the pyramid is what holds up the upper bricks of the pyramid. Like, they're all important, man. So, um, it's really cool because it's like, you know, even if you're some, you know, unfamous farmer, you can be important to the history of the world because you had children and you built history and they will interact with other people at school in their work you know who some guy they catch on the street and help change a tire you know i mean you never know how you help someone at just the right time you know and have a good influence on a neighbor so like having children changes the course of history in in maybe you're not famous but maybe your great grandkids will be famous you know if you pass on your ideals and your mentality and the church's doctrine to them like that keeps this whole project going so don't underestimate the importance of getting married and having children and starting a family this is, this is some real shit um so you you take the life you were gonna have you know your career path your world traveling all that shit the things that people wank off today like the progressives oh they love you know keeping their money and being able to go to rome on a moment's notice like they say in uh when harry met sally and it ends up just being this cold hard mexican tile where you also um uh you know sterilize the act and that's great um it's, it's actually not great at all i'm being very sarcastic and 
marriage should be a selfless thing. And like I said, it's not just to your spouse, but to the rest of everybody, to your kids. You know, you give up your nightlife as an adult so that your kids can have fun forcing you to watch Paw Patrol until the wee hours <laughs> or, you know, whatever they're into these days. And, um, but that, that dedicates your life to God and not just yours, but your, you and your spouse's life to God, right? Um, it now really only holds meaning if it's doing glory to God, which is a great thing. Um, I'm really sorry if I'm like all up in your Cheetos, but I just, I know that my microphone sucks, so I just thought I would, anyway, I'm sorry. Side note. So, um, <clears throat> another thing to think about is that the Bible begins and ends and climaxes with marriage, if you think about it. God creates the world in seven days, and on the sixth day, he creates Adam, you know, and that's, Genesis is interesting because it has kind of a, it has a double take. <laughs> there's the whole creation thing, and then there's like a, whoa, back up. I, I meant to give you more details on the sixth day. And then there's this whole, like, retcon of Adam being made. But <clears throat> the, the point is, like, very early in the Bible, Adam and Eve are created, and they're created equal and of the same stuff. Adam made of the mud, Eve made of the rib of Adam. So he, she is literally bone of his bone, flesh of his flesh. The same shit is what he's saying. Like, like that's, that's a statement of equality, right? And that's what makes them, uh, well, there's a good word for this, the complementarity of the sexes, right? Where each sex, male and female, only makes sense with the existence of the other being paired together. I kind of went through this with the whole triangle diagram, but it's like, why be a fertile ground to receive if there's nothing to receive? Why be a donator if or an initiator if there's if it's if you're just shooting blanks, right? If there's if there's no uh, point to it, if there's nothing to grow with it, right? I mean, you're just you're wasting your life. So Adam and Eve, you know, they don't have a ceremony, but they're born already married. You know, it's not good that the man should be alone. He's born, or Eve is created even, as the, the complement to Adam, right? And then they fuck it up, and then um, we go through time, and then, and, then, and then there comes Jesus, right? And Jesus, as I discussed a little bit in the Triangle episode, number six, um, he is the new Adam. He is birthing the new era. He's also the inverse of Adam in that, you know, God creates Adam from nothingness, then creates Eve, woman, from Adam. Eve says, I deny God, and everything is ruined. And God says, one day there'll be a savior. And then he says, hey, woman, from you there will come a savior, who's like the inverse of Eve. And instead of saying, I know better than God, Mary says, no, 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 God's in control. And the inverse happens. And from woman without man is Jesus created, who is God. So, so, so from God, man is made of nothing. From that man, woman is made. Without sex. Intercourse. And then from woman, this man is made without intercourse. And this man goes right back to God. Right? I mean, you, you see the mirror image here. It's kind of fucked up. So he, so that itself, you know, Jesus dying on the cross and setting up the church before he does so, establishing it with Peter and the apostles, that in itself is a marriage. He's dedicated his mortal life, ready to die for that church, for the Savior of us all. Right? So... They, they, on the cross, that is the marriage. Actually, more than that, Jesus' whole life, his existence, he is fully man and fully God, unionized. His existence at all is itself a marriage. Does that make sense? This is one union of God and man in the, pre in the character of the person of Jesus, right? So that's like the climax middle of the Bible how does it end? You get to Revelation, 
Revelation is this, like, fucked up apocalyptic book with all these weird-ass visions, and it is a marriage. The whole thing is a marriage supper. Um, I, I should probably do a whole other episode on this, but honestly, I would just forward you to Scott Hahn's The Fourth Cup. It's a good book, and I want to say there's a different one, too. But, spoiler alert, um, Revelations is first part cryptically describing the fall of Rome as it's happening in real time. So it sounds like it's being futuristic, but it's a really just kind of... Are you familiar with uh, Don McLean's American Pie? Where it's like this hilarious epic poem about shit that actually happened. A couple of pop stars died in a plane. But it, like that just happened, but he's writing it like it's a legend. That's actually what the first half of the book of Revelation is. It's the fall of Rome written as American Pie hate to break it to you, but it's the destruction of the temple as the temple was IRL being destructed. And, uh, but then the back half of it is the wedding supper of the lamb, if you follow that one. And if you look at the order of it, it follows almost exactly the liturgy of the mass. So, pro tip, like any good instruction booklet, the last chapter of the Bible is Here's how to have a mass, BG Dubs. If you want to ever have your own mass, this is the this is the DIY. And um, yeah, so the Book of Revelation is really fucked up. Because, like I don't know where the Protestants get this rapture shit from. That word doesn't even appear. Like their Protestants are dumb. That hate or sorry, not Protestants are dumb. Protestantism is dumb. Protestants are cool people, but uh, well they can be. And um, <laughs> but. Uh, no, Revelation, like, fucking sit down with it, read Scott Hahn, it's straight up the instructions for how to have a mass. But it's cryptic because it's fucking, it, when it was written, it was banned in Rome. If you were a Christian, you were fed to the lions, man. They're, they're not gonna, like, say that shit, you know, out in the open. But, the Bible begins with the marriage of Adam and Eve. Climaxes with the marriage of Jesus himself as a God and man, ends with the wedding supper of the Lamb. We've all come, you know, at the end of time, to celebrate the line of Judah and his ultimate sacrifice at a wedding, right? So, like, marriage is really, really, really fucking important. It's the most important thing ever in all of existence. Um, because even ourselves, we have a soul, we are fully, I mean, I want to say divine, but, you know, we're not God, 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 but we're, div we're, but we're spiritual, right? Which came from God. So we are fully spiritual and we're fully bodily. Not this Manichaeism shit. We are, in our own lives, a marriage of spirit and flesh. Yeah? That's why marriage, like... You do not fuck with marriage. I, I cannot stress this enough. You do not fuck with marriage. Because what it means to be human is wrapped up in this idea. If you're going to be Catholic. <laughs> but, you know, I mean, the whole idea of a Catholic belief system is that this is actually the truth. Like, the empirical truth. I just can't prove to you the spiritual part of it, so... Eh. Um... You know, with beakers and shit. But, <laughs> and God forbid a PhD, these fucking cheap bad. Um, so, Jesus himself also talks about marriage plenty throughout the Bible. That's what my notes say. Oh, yeah. So, um, so people are asking something about, uh, on the Sermon on the Mount, right? A couple of Pharisees, they're like, yeah, what's up, JC? How about, like, um... Dude, Homefry, uh, has a wife, then he divorces her, then he has another wife, divorces her, and then they go to heaven. Who's he married to in heaven? And Jesus is like, okay, first off, Moses allowed divorce because of your hardness of heart. Meaning, you're a shitbag. But in the beginning, it wasn't so. That was not the plan with Adam and Eve when God established what marriage is with Adam and Eve. So he's like, look, Moses relented because he was sick of your shit. But you're not supposed to have divorce. And Catholics do not believe in divorce. We don't, we do not divorce. When you get married, that is for life. So, like, sorry, that was that way. Um, like, seriously, 
if you need to get married later in life because you're not sure, then fucking do it later. Like, this is this should be a one and done. Do not F this up. And once you commit, you commit. It's like, it's like if you were going to be a good driver, which most of us are not, but if you're a good driver, you start turning and you finish that turn. And if you realize, oh shit, I meant to turn at the next intersection, no one fucking cares. You started the turn... Don't screw everybody else up on the street. Don't confuse someone else. Don't have a pedestrian run out in the street when you're about to... You finish the turn. You're committed. When you started it, you finish what you started. That's what commitment means, right? So when you get married to someone in the Catholic Church, there is no divorce. There is no taking it back. It is you and the spouse and God as the Holy Spirit, the third member of your marriage, the cherry in your bonding, who, there's no taking it back, okay? If stuff goes south, you make that shit work. And this is really important, like, there's, I mean, I really don't even know where to start with this, because divorce is so commonplace in America, and around the world these days, and, you know, the Western culture, it, that it's hard to even explain, like, like they, it's difficult for people to wrap their heads around the idea that there just couldn't be a divorce. Like, why, oh, husbands are so, you know, abusive, and people want to rape and stuff, and maybe you just get bored, and it's like, the, the, the fact that we made divorce so commonplace really lowers the bar for where people are like, you know, I just kind of, I didn't have enough fun in my 20s and I want to do that again. And I'm 40 and we've had kids. So I just want to get divorced and have like a second life. You know, like, to be honest, since nobody watches this podcast, my boy Tim in uh, episode two, who we did the Wally World with, that's the state that he was in. Like his wife left him for funsies because she didn't give a shit about what marriage means. Honestly, I don't know if Tim did either. But it sucks to me to see people treat marriage as that disposable. I am talking about a fucking covenant. God came down and made this forever between the two of you. You will work your shit out and if you don't like it, it doesn't matter because the marriage is not about you two. It's about God and his plan and what you do to build the kingdom of God. That's what marriage is to a Catholic, okay? And if you get a paper signed by the state, that's a joke. That is a fucking joke. I will piss on that piece of paper because it's not even worth the paper it's written on, all right? Real marriage, real ass marriage is the one where God is involved. And he says, this is bound forever. This is sacramental, okay? That's a real marriage. And I mean, just to just to twist the knife, I mean a man and a woman, and you saw the triangle, and you, I hope you understand why it takes a man and a woman to get married. Okay? <clears throat> because that is the design of biology and evolution, which is the design of God, and it just, it, come on, dude, like, why is this even a question? But, Jesus says, Moses only allowed divorce for the hardness of heart. And in the beginning, that was not the design of marriage. And also, when you get to heaven, you'll understand what marriage truly is. And it's not even going to be any way that you conceive it here. This whole divorce, gayness, any of these things is not... Marriage really is that Wally world of the triangle that I pointed out before. It's that abstract look at... What is masculine? What is feminine? What is that relationship that you two in a marriage mirror of the Trinity, right? That's what it's really about. So, so one of the things that Jesus says in that Sermon on the Mount is that he says, you've heard in the Ten Commandments, which is like, you know, the big Ten Commandments, that you shall not commit adultery. But Jesus says, even if you so much as look at a woman with lust in your heart, that is committing adultery because of the spiritual sin, of the intention or the will to have sex with someone you're not married to, right? 
And what he's getting at is... You gotta... That's a counterexample, okay? Jesus is not trying to... I mean, he's positing it as a counterexample, but he's not saying, here's the rule and here's how you'll be punished. Jesus did not come to punish people. He came to fulfill the law, right? And so, like, like okay, here's one of the big deals, right? Throughout history, not to throw Jews under the bus, this is not anti-Semitic to say, and I think that a lot of Jews would actually agree with me on this one. Jews are really big on... What was the law? What did Moses say? What did God say to Moses? And what is the most I can do without violating that thing? And it comes down to legalism, right? Look at Sabbath laws, right? You can't, you know, lift this object more than 10 pounds. But if you get some goy, you get some Gentile to show up and carry it for you. Well, that's fine, because he's fucking unclean anyway. That swine's going to hell. But, um, but if he brings you your shit, then that's not a sin. It's not, it's not a sin on you anyway. It's a sin on somebody who's already fallen. And it's like, you're, now you're just obsessed with the letter of the law and winning some shit in court. And that's not what God called you to, okay? God wants you to love like he loves. God wants you to feel the way he feels. He wants you to act like him, which is all positive, all good, all giving. Not, what can I get away with, Right? Make sense? And again, I'm not I'm not trying to insult Jews. They make great lawyers. But but I think any Jew would agree with me. Look at Ari Shapiro's um fucking uh I think it was just called Jew. <laughs> His stand up is fantastic. But he's right about this. And um it, it, Jesus is trying to say, look, if you look at a chick with lust in your heart, you've already committed adultery. But he's not trying to say, I'm lowering the standard of what gets you into hell. I'm not trying to make it easier for you to get into hell. No, 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 no. I want you to look again at what marriage is. It is the positive assertion of the commitment. Everything I just said earlier about, like, being oriented toward building this thing, right? It's like, here's one of the things I hate about, you know, side note. Sorry to get political, but one of the things that I hate about conservatives is that they don't really have a goal to reach for progressives don't either progressives just want to you know make progress but like towards what uh, the destruction of christianity but then like what do conservatives want do they want the fulfillment of christianity not really they kind of just want to plant a flag and say this is where progressivism stops and it's like well that's not doing much though you know you're not building the next culture you don't have forming the next society and that's what Jesus is getting at he's like look the way that marriage needs to be is not trying to figure out where exactly your ball and chain of commitment you know where does marriage trap you and what can you do that is not going to violate your marriage vows no 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 you should be actively enthusiastically pursuing your spouse pursuing the future pursuing service to god this is what marriage is about, finding purpose in your life and building the city of God. You should be enthusiastic, singing a song as you work. Be all about it, you know? And it's like, once you do that, you don't get distracted by some other bitch with big titties because you realize that she's sidetracking you from your ability to build the city of God. Once, once you've prioritized working for God over getting a sweet nut busted, then then you know what marriage is, right? Once you're, That's when your focus is right. That's what Jesus is really trying to say in that line, right? Is that it's... I hate this line, but it is really true. I think it was from Friends. I know it was Jennifer Aniston that said it, but I don't remember if it was in Friends or a movie. But she says, I don't want you to just do the dishes. I want you to want to do the dishes. And whoever your boyfriend is like, I don't know, what the fuck does that mean? You know? But that's that's actually what I'm saying here is that God's not saying, I don't want you not to cheat. I want you to be so married that cheating doesn't occur to you. Right? That's what Jesus is trying to say about this whole lustful look thing. Um so, so, so we just, we need to 
take that Wally World approach of um, not trying to look at the nuts and bolts of what marriage is and the hard definitions, but think in broader terms, more abstract terms about what does it mean to be bound and with a purpose and moving somewhere and in union with God, right? So, you know, God created marriage, defined it, as it were, before it existed in the material world, before it was ever manifested. It was God's idea before it became a material thing, right? So, what we see reflected in the world, even in, through the triangle lesson, you know, some things get penises and some things get vaginas, or I guess you should say uh, in the gametes is, is more important, as Brett Weinstein would say, um, you know, the small gamete and the carrier, the egg, they, these are made as complementary um, halves of what it means to live, right? This is baked into reality. And God designed this concept before it became manifest in these things, like the cosmic rays and the spark chamber. So, um, so, like, there's, there's just, another, another good metaphor for that is, um, you should really Google the history of aluminum mining, because aluminum, back in, like, the 1800s, was a really expensive metal, because it was hard to, well, it wasn't that hard to find, but it was difficult to isolate. And, um, and so aluminum was, I mean, it was really handy, right? I mean, it's like, <laughs> you've seen the Festivus episode of Seinfeld. It's got a great strength to weight ratio, you know, it's, it's, it's malleable and, uh, sterile and all these other properties that are just fantastic. But acquiring aluminum was really fucking hard to do because in nature, aluminum is always found bound to this other mineral that has garbage. And so like getting it separated from that garbage mineral was really hard to do up until uh late 1800s around the turn of the 1900s somebody realized hey if you melt this shit and put a magnet in it you pull all the aluminum is it a magnet i don't know i got that wrong but there's some way through it's called electrolysis i think um where you can just separate easily like the, the garbage falls to the bottom of this pool of water and all the aluminum floats on the surface and drifts toward this magnet or at least this electro whatever garbage and suddenly aluminum was cheap as shit because it was an easy way to separate it from the chaff right so it's difficult in our day and age to look at marriage as being a valuable thing because we have so much chaff attached to it. So many shitty spouses, so many abusive people, so many flimsy laws, so much divorce enabling all the fucking time, the internet and porn. Like, marriage is almost a lost cause in this day and age. But Catholics are here to beat this drum to say what marriage is is something God defined as one man and one woman because who we are and what we are and what we're made of in even in our individual selves being flesh and spirit bound is is reflected like this all it's a fractal description of the universe it's so much more fucking important than your goddamn identity or your sad little i can't handle somebody's you know taste in food like just marriage is the most fucking important thing in the universe all right that is the catholic thing okay and so like my note says, being alive is a marriage of soul and flesh. No, I just, I covered that. We're good. Jesus being incarnated, especially. Yeah, I already covered that, too. Special commentary. Oh, man, look at this. I'm just fucking good. See, all these things come naturally to me. I'm like, I'm like, what's up? Because I, I get this. It's all up in my head. It's all in my noggins here. Um, yeah, no, that's totally it. Oh, okay, so here's one of the other things, right? Is, um... One of the things that's admittedly, admittedly difficult in marriage is that uh, I'm a dude and I will, no matter how dedicated I am to my wife, I will never fully understand my wife. 
not just because she has a different life. I mean, that's a big part of it, too. You know, I didn't have her parents, and I didn't go to the same... Well, I, we did go to the same school, but different times. But really, the killer is... Um, I don't have a vagina and uh, or estrogen as much as she does. And so, like, I really have to admit, I could never understand what it's like to be her as a woman. And yet, we are made for each other. And we are committed to each other for the rest of our lives. And we're supposed to be this unified thing, a single unit, in service to God, right? But it's this asymptotic thing where I can always get closer to her, but I can never be her. And it's not even so much because of her separate life that she lived, her experiences. It's, it's the vagina part. It's the I'm not in a woman's body part that I will never get to know. And I'm sorry, trans folks, but you also have the surgery. You'll never actually get to know what it's like to be the other sex. So suck it. Suck a dick, suck a fake forearm, sculpted dick, whatever you've got, okay? The fact of the matter is, the relationship that marriage is supposed to be is that asymptotic thing where we can always get ever closer to God himself, but never understand what it's like to be God, right? You see this parallel now in the marriage where man, males, men, learn about what it's like to get close to God, but never really know God. In their relationship with woman, it's a limit. And in the same way, women, the wife, will always get closer to God through knowing her husband, but never quite be her husband, and also never quite be God. Yeah? So we're all married to God. We can get ever closer to God, but we will never know what it's like to be God. Layers, motherfucking players. So, like, this is why marriage is so fucking incredible. I, I, just the whole concept of marriage blows my fucking mind. So, um... Also, ha <laughs> ha! Fun fact, uh, when you get married... As I said, every sacrament, all seven of them, have a symbol, you know, pouring of water, eating of bread, saying the words of absolution. There's a spiritual reality that takes place that reflects the symbolism of the physical ritual that took place. Yeah. When it comes to marriage, the union of the man and the woman before God, represented by the priest in persona Christi, that marriage is uh, not fully realized. By realized, I mean like made manifest. I mean like universally a true thing, both in this world and the next, in the spiritual knowledge. Until all those things converge in the consummation of the marriage. And I mean sex. And that's why sex is so awesome, BT dubs. Like the Catholics are very much behind sex. Sex is a great thing. All the fluids, all the sweat, all the fun and the exertion and the unity and the being inside each other is like, I mean, I'm like, ooh, that's so gross. Oh, oh, Theo, you're so nasty. But it's like, no, actually, that's beautiful. Like, that is, that is, you are taking the spiritual truths that we just talked about and making them literally true. Not literally, materially true, right? Occupying the same body for a moment. Go read... St. Pope John Paul II's Theology of the Body. Or, if you want to shortcut that shit, Christopher West's Theology of the Body for Beginners. I'm, like, not lying about this. This is the most important, sacramental, special thing, is to swap fluids and be inside your spouse. Or have your spouse inside you, depending on which one you are. And, um, like, it's, it's a meaningful thing. It's a... This sacrament given to you, administered by the priest, is not fulfilled until you've consummated this marriage. And with Catholics, they also mean, don't hold anything back. No condoms, no birth control, the au natural of the human animal needs to consummate that shit. Real ass sex. Real ass normal sex, all right? is like the fulfillment of God's design of the human animal, 
of the of the intelligent design of evolution, right? And it's so risky. Yeah, you could get pregnant. Oh, my dad, on your wedding night. Oh, yeah. I thought you guys were planning a cool, you know, honeymoon. And if you went on the honeymoon the next week, it's okay. You can drink. The feed, the, the you know, the baby, the, the little, you know, ball of cells is not going to get affected by your alcohol for at least a month. But, for real though, like, don't, like, why would you uninvite God to the most important sacrament? Why would you tell him, don't be here? Why would you put a condom up or take some medicines that make you infertile for a bit? You know, an IUD or a, you know, birth control. Like, he should be here for that shit. He's, he's as much a part of your marriage. He is the top of this triangle in your marriage, alright? So he needs to be there when you have sex. And the thing is, he's all about it, dude. He's like, I made you guys for this shit. Sex is great. Please enjoy it. Please give yourselves to each other. Please hold nothing back. Please sing survivor lyrics to each other. That's what I did. Well, during the wedding, not the sex part, the consummation part. But, um, it just, it, I am so sad that sex has been so devalued and commoditized that we can't even fathom the beauty of unrestricted sex with your spouse as being a beautiful thing. Like, this all sounds dirty and disgusting, and it's like, no, do you understand this is, this is the kind of lovemaking that Adam had with Eve in the garden before there was sin, when it was, when everything was hunky-dory. Walking with God in the, in the, in the cool still of the evening, you know? Every time you have sex with your spouse, that's what it should be like. That's the best sex. Sometimes when I was grow growing up, you know, I had some nerd-ass friends, some progressive buddies, be like, oh, don't you want to be good at sex when you get married? What if you get married and it turns out your spouse is, like, bad at sex? I'm like, what does that mean? Like, what, they don't give you a great blowjob? The blowjob is terrible cause, because, um, also, uh, if my dick is in her mouth, I feel like I'm kissing my dick when I kiss her later, so, like, how many times do I just brush before I get over that shit? Or vice versa. Like, this, you guys are just doing this all wrong. I, I always thought this. Where I, it was just like... They're not seeing the forest for the trees here, you know? They're out for the great-ass orgasm. Instead of thinking... Your role in the cosmic fucking history, your calling to greatness, your imbuing of spirituality where you are now a physical part of the temple of God. That was the kind of sex I wanted to have. Epic fucking cosmos changing sex. Not like, oh great orgasm sex. I think you're looking at the wrong part of the equation if that's what you're concerned about. So, thing is, Rudy, you've probably gone on past time, but sex has four critical components that I covered during the triangle episode, where sex must be free. It's four F's, but I'll break them down to be more specific. Sex must be free, full, faithful, and fruitful. By that I mean free, voluntary. You don't have sex against your will. Obviously, because that's rape. Yes, there's such a thing where, you know, your husband having sex with you against your will is rape. It's a true thing. And um, so every time you consummate your vows, and you should think of sex as renewing your vows. But um, it should be freely given, voluntarily given, on the part of both parties. Okay? Um... Second, full and total. Full total means you do not hold anything back, including your fertility. You don't use condoms. You don't use birth control. You don't, um, you know, try to pull out or put it in a hole that doesn't belong, you guys. It's not the way to do it, okay? It's not the right way to do it. You're going to have sacramental lovemaking, renewing of vows. It's full. It's total. You don't hold anything back, including your fertility. You have to be open to children, right? Faithful, devoted, that's the only person that you're 
having these vows with, right? And then, and then last, fruitful. It's up to God whether or not your sex is going to be productive, you know, whether you're going to have a kid. And, um, but that's kind of the, the biggest thing is that when it's, when it's already faithful and full and free, well, not the free part so much as the full and faithful, when you have the door wide open to God, He'll decide if this is the week or the time that you get pregnant. Some people have a hard time getting pregnant. Okay, let God drive, dude. Because there's lots of other people that try to force this. Like, oh no, this is my life and I'm going to decide when I get pregnant. I'm going to go to, you know, IVM clinics and all that shit. And it's like, wait, IV, IVM is ivermectin. In vitro fertilizer. IVF, I'm sorry. IVF clinics. You, you don't get to choose. You really, like, you don't get to choose, honestly. Keep trying. Because sometimes you never know when someone is, you know, Mary's cousin Elizabeth, who got pregnant in her old age. Sometimes God works fucking miracles. Let him do his thing, okay? It's his job to create. And this is actually one of the... I'm going to back up a step here too, right? God is creating... He is not done creating the universe, all right? It's not that he was, you know, done in six days and he just quit. He got back to work after that. He's still creating the universe. Now, today, every human life you create with your spouse, you are taking part in creation. It's like being a parent and saying, hey, my kid, do you want to help me wash the dishes? Do you want to help me do the lawn, mow the lawn? Like, maybe they're not great at it. <laughs> <laughs> but it's really nice to have their help and say, this is how we're taking care of this house. And if you look at the whole universe as being God's house, then when we, as married couples, generate new life, we're changing history. Like I just said, maybe you're not famous, maybe your kid's not famous, maybe your great-grandkids are famous. You're changing history just by existing, just in their interactions. And you're taking part in creation, in creating this storyline, this universe. So it's important for you to both contribute to creation, but also fold in and fall in on God's plan and let him drive. And if he says you're infertile today, I hate to break it to you, but that's true. But that doesn't mean you'll be infertile forever. Keep trying and you never know what miracles happen. And when he says it's time, it will happen. He will change course for you. But don't force that shit through medical intervention. Because that is not your role. You are cheating God. You think you know better than God to change biology that way. That's why gods think that IVF is a sin. Okay? Because we have historical examples of when... Barren wounds suddenly became pregnant. So, if that shit turns out, God is stronger than reality. What's up? So, yep, triangle diagrams. We already covered that shit. Rules. For, oh, hey, uh, I got a reference here. I'm gonna just point it toward you because I wrote it down. I'm. I don't even know what this goes. Jordan Peterson's Twelve Rules for Life. Check out page three fifteen. This is probably for me to look at before I started this, and I didn't do that. But th page three fifteen, he talks about how the consciousness or logos is male in its spirit, and it is love in the action and produces the universe to generate more nodes. Yeah, I think I pretty much covered that more or less but go ahead and cross reference me with JP because he's a pretty cool guy I'm always like blown away by Jordan Peterson because it's like he doesn't realize that he accidentally derived Catholicism again from you know uh, not bare bones or even grassroots or even first principles what's the word I'm looking for um, he re-derived it from the basics he came to the same conclusion he's, he's, he's Catholic and he doesn't know it is what I'm trying to say um, but it's funny that it came to it through his own individual, uh, independent research, you know, using Jungian symbolism and shit. Um, but yeah, so Adam, we kind of covered this in the Triangle episode. Adam is the first one who deposits his love with Eve. He, he recognizes himself in Eve, 
Who is bone of his bone, flesh of his flesh? And she responds by saying, yeah, dude, I'm fucking all in, and they have kids. Um, Jesus, the same way, uh, begins his love by saying he sees himself in the humans. Actually, that is true and strange when you think about it, because it's like, Jesus had the ability to heal the sick and resurrect the dead, like Lazarus, and yet he goes to Lazarus' grave, and, you know, Jesus wept. It's like the smallest Bible verse ever. And it's like, why are you crying when you know in like 10 minutes you're bringing back to life? But Jesus' humanity, like he was really all in on that shit is what we're getting at here. Is that he, he didn't hold back, you know. He didn't put his God birth control on and say, oh, well, I'm just going to like, in a sterile way, pretend I'm sad for Lazarus, you know. He, no, he went all in on the chance that Lazarus couldn't be resurrected. And then he did it with full faith, right? Um, and new Christians are produced by baptism and priests. Yeah, the same thing. So priests, priests dedicate their lives. This, this is going to come back. We're talking about holy orders. I'm going to do a whole other episode on all the other sacraments. It's just the marriage is so fucking crazy that it deserved its own episode to me. Um, but priests essentially marry their parish they dedicate their lives that's why they're called father um you know there's mothers nuns that run nunneries and convents but but you hear about the father the most right the father father pete father father pete's an asshole but father uh father robert baron father tim is one of my favorites personally, he's local, uh, Father Mike Schmitz, these guys, they, they got their own parishes, and that's who they take care of, and that's who they're married to, and that is their family, and so they deposit their love, their whole, like, again, what is love, right, and I don't mean baby don't hurt me, I mean, like, it's not chocolate, because you wouldn't fuck a Reese's, and it's not, um, having children, I love my children, but I would never fuck my children, I was fucked up. I, I, there's a lot of things I love. I love my job, but I would never fuck my office desk. Like, what love is, love, 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 is you, it's dedication. It's will of the other, the good of the other as other, right? And that is a priest. It's that kind of love that powers his marriage to the parish and to the magisterium and to God's work on earth. So yes, the priest does not take a wife. The priest can also never be a woman because the woman is supposed to receive and fertilize and grow and birth more. And this all goes back to the triangle, man. It's not about the plumbing. It's not about the parts. It's about the role, okay? It's about how anything gets created or is good ever People just don't get that. They just think that they can lop off and get zipper tits and, you know, be whatever they want. And you, you just don't get that, okay? You don't know what love is if you're... They're little mini-gods. They think that they rule their own little mini-universes. And that's, that's the height of being conceited, okay? With Catholicism, which is you know, established by God himself through Jesus to the apostles and carrying on through history through the Roman Rite, Catholic Church, and up to the popes. I'll give the Eastern Orthodox a shout out. They're, they got the word too. But that's just not what marriage is. That's not what being male or female is. The The meaning of masculinity and femininity is lies in marriage and i don't just mean having a ceremony and i for real damn sure don't mean a fucking tax break okay and your equal rights and all your horse shit you are you're looking down the wrong you're getting lost in the wally world all right you're looking at the wrong shit you're getting distracted the abstract idea of marriage that i've talked about the cosmic marriage is the only one that matters and is the whole reason we have a life at all and the whole reason we're born to one sex or the other and that's the only choices we have.
and this is really critical to the future of the human race. Because God designed the universe that way, and we will fuck ourselves, and not in the fun way, if we don't live in it. It's not a question, again, of legalism, of saying, what can I get away with? How can I be the most female without really being female and still have a dick? No, 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 no. You need to lean in, motherfucker. You need to love the sex you were born in. If you were a female, be the most fucking female you can be. If you were a male, be the most fucking male you can be. And by that I mean, the male is dedicated to the woman, and the female is dedicated to the man. And all of this is all subservient to God. God who is the author of the universe. If you're searching for meaning in your life, look between your fucking legs. Because you've got a ticket. You've already been called. It's written for you. Why are you searching? Isn't it great to belong? Isn't it great to know where you're supposed to fit? You already do. God already has you. That's why marriage is so awesome. And you do not fuck with marriage. Every other sacrament is just a different manifestation, spin-off, play on what this marriage is. Okay? And even then, take the Wally World idea. What I just said that everything marriage was is close. Really fucking close. And still not what God's idea of marriage is. You need to be pursuing what God's idea of marriage is. Try to be that thing. Try to, don't, not legalism, not lust in your heart if you look at somebody, no, like you want, you need to want that thing that God's idea of marriage is. Chase it, find it, feel for it, reach for it, yearn for it, okay? God wants you to be married to him. In one way or another. In all the ways. Actually, all the ways. I hope I did this whole thing injustice. <sighs> but I'm just one man. Get out of theology, fans. In the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen.